Welcome to Healing and Made Free with Janet Boynes Ministries. Thank you for listening. Janet will be talking about her struggle with addiction, alcohol, drugs, eating disorders, unwanted same-sex attraction, and living a homosexual life. Janet has survived all those things by the grace of God. Janet's not a doctor, she's not a therapist, she's not a psychotherapist, she's not a licensed counselor. Janet is an ordained pastor and wants to show you God's promises, how God has set her free, and how you can be set free. What he has done for her, he will do it for you. If healing and freedom are what you want, you have come to the right place at the right time. Let's get started. Here is Janet Boynes. I am here with my good friend, Pastor Dwayne Sheriff. Welcome to Healing and Me for you with Janet Boynes. Amen. It's a blessing to be with you. Listen, before we jump into these things, Miss Janet, I just want to say how much I love you and, and truly respect you in ministry and your moral compass and just your willingness to put yourself out in this in this culture and, and also interviewing me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm appreciative of that. Well, I'm honored. You know, I I know that you have uh, a heart for God. You love people. And you have a great ministry, but I, I'm not going to start there. I want to talk about your family. You know, I was reading up a, on you a yeah. little bit, and I know you came from Central Florida, and yes. you met your lovely wife, Sue, who I get to talk with, who I consider a mentor to me when I'm having tough times, um, out there on the tennis courts. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and she introduced you to Jesus Christ. Is that correct? Or She she was used mightily by God. I, I had known the Lord early endeavored to serve him with all of my heart, but had failed so miserably and just was so guilt-ridden and condemned and even a lot of shame with not being able to serve like I knew I needed to and wanted to. And, mm -hmm. and so I was in a backslidden condition and she moved into the apartments where I did uh, my practice times and teaching. And she would actually listen to me out her window uh, and I learned something later about what she experienced. She was drawn to me teaching. Mm -hmm. And that gift was evident, even in a backslidden condition, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And I was an excellent teacher. Uh, and now I'm using that the way God intended it, teaching the word of God and the things of God. But yeah, that's what drew her to me. And the Lord spoke to her and said she would witness to me. And sure enough, our paths crossed and uh, and buddy, did she witness. I uh, I wound up having an open vision of the cross in her apartment. Wow. You know, before we go into your ministry stuff, a lot of people don't know this about you or maybe some people do. But you played tennis at one time and was going pro or went pro. Let's talk about that for a minute, because when you have an opportunity to go and and go into pro or, or make all this money and you choose another path, people scratch their heads and think, what? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I just had such a passion for the game. I had a gift. I didn't even get started till my senior year in high school, picking up a racket over the summer before I went into high school. And by the end of high school, I was number one. Mm -hmm. I got a two-year scholarship to a junior college, started at the bottom. By the time I graduated, was number one. Then I went to the University of Central Florida and started at the bottom uh, in my uh, uh, junior year there. And by my senior year, I was number one on that team. So I was definitely going pro. I, I don't think I would have made it at the top level uh, for various reasons, but I was good enough to make it. And I definitely could have made a lot of money teaching. I'm, I'm sure you could have. And I'm grateful that you chose this over tennis because then I wouldn't probably know you and <laughs> be able to glean from the awesome preaching you do. You have a gift at preaching. But before I get into that, in 1987, I'm not sure when you got married, but you started church, Victory Life Church. How did you know you were called to the ministry before you even started this church? Well, I mean, I... I, I met the Lord in 1965 at a, a young age, and by nine, just a year or two later, I heard the Lord call me, uh, literally heard his voice and was so confused, but it was so real, Miss Janet, that I packed a bag crying and was leaving home to go into the ministry. And 
praise God, both of my parents, I led them to the Lord eventually. They didn't know the Lord then. They thought I'd lost my mind. And of course, I'm crying even more because I don't want to leave home. Don't know where I'm going. I love my parents, but something big spoke to me. So I I just knew God had called me and that's why I served him. It's amazing how committed I was all the way up to my junior year year in high school. And my brother got killed in a car accident. It just threw me in a tailspin uh, and I kind of backslid from there. But uh, yeah, I've known God's called me in my earliest years. Uh, and now I'm just enjoying it thoroughly. So you lost the brother, which I didn't know my condolences and how old was he? And it caused you to not want to serve God. I lost my mother three years ago and in all transparency, people don't realize the impact that can have on your life, losing a parent, losing a loved one. And I didn't blame God, but I didn't want to serve him at that time. You know, I didn't want to read my Bible. I didn't want to pray yeah. I was going through yeah. a part of depression. Was your brother your only sibling, or are there others? No, he was my younger brother. I have another younger brother and a sister. Mm -hmm. Uh, My story's a little unique in the sense of it it wasn't that I didn't want to serve God after that, but some well-intended but certainly misguided Christians came to our home. My parents don't know the Lord, and they're saying that basically our sins brought this upon the family, and it was God's judgment you know, for our sins. And so that just, (laughs) it just threw me. Yeah. It just truly threw me. And I thought, well, my sins are no less than my brothers. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to die too, I guess. And it, it just confused me. Uh, and one of the reasons I teach so much on grace, so much on the true nature of God, so much on his loving kindness Mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature and complete forgiveness and acceptance is because of my experience that had someone explained to me this wasn't God and judgment against me or my family, then perhaps things would have been different for me. Right. Well, it, that that's pretty powerful. I know I lost my brother to AIDS in 1999. He was gay. Um, he came out in that light before I did, but you know, AIDS took his life. Yeah. And sometimes sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Because I never anticipated being out there that long myself, but we're talking about you. Those of you that are listening, I'm talking to Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, who has a ministry, Dwayne Sheriff Ministries, and who literally started the church, Victory Life Church. Where is that church? Because I think your son has taken over now or yeah, he's the senior pastor. I'm one of the main communicators still and senior elder on the eldership team that oversees him and the other teams. But uh, yeah, the main campus is in Durant, Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. but we have 12 campuses in different states and a lot of small groups and home, home campuses, home groups that are home churches. We can't even number those, but uh, we have quite a few campuses in Oklahoma, Texas, and now Colorado. That, that's amazing. You know, two or more gathered in his name. There he is. And you're not the only one who's having these small churches in our homes now. There are people who cannot get to church. And, you know, to be able to have somebody lead something like that or listen to you on the big screen or your son on the big screen, that's amazing, the technology that we have today. Absolutely. Even what you and I are doing. I mean, I'm turning yeah. 65 and in April. So, you know, I, I might be older, I might be younger, but neither here nor there. This was not back in our era. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the one thing we're sure of is you look a lot better than I do. So we'll go, we'll go there. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Dwayne, I want to talk about your newest book, Counterculture. I don't know if it's going to be upside down, but this is the book. And you you wrote this book, Answering a Woke Culture with Love, Light, and Life. People hear the word woke culture. They don't have a clue what that means. They assume. But what does that mean to you, woke culture, in today's topic of conversation? Yeah. (laughs) Woke. (laughs) Well, interesting enough, uh, one of the biggest honors of my life was the my publisher actually heard me minister at a conference and, and came to me afterwards and said, you've got to write a book on this. There's nothing out there like this. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was so honored that a publisher would even ask me. And boy, God really helped me write this thing. And it is having a huge impact. Yep. Uh, 
And the reason I wrote the book was because the church doesn't understand at large how that we are supposed to be a counterculture, thus the title counterculture, to a culture gone awry. Mm -hmm. we're, we're experiencing a culture of hate, a culture of death, and a culture of darkness at an unprecedented level. These things have always been in our world because of sin, mm -hmm. but not, not at the extent we're seeing today and the rapid pace of increase of those three and the lack of understanding within the church. So culture has always been something that my son and I both knew was important. Your culture is what you believe and how you behave. That's what makes up culture. Mm -hmm. And every church has a culture. Every uh, nation has a culture. Cities have cultures. Uh, culture is just a group think in belief systems and how the group behaves uh, unilaterally. Mm -hmm. And so the church is not called to be a subculture. Mm -hmm. We're called to be a counterculture. We're called by Jesus to be salt and light mm -hmm. in the earth and in the world. And the church basically had become a subculture within this culture, embracing things that, that Jesus has taught us to expose and expel. Mm -hmm. And so that was my true motivation, was trying to build churches, minister in churches to help them develop their culture. And you could attest to this, Janet. Uh, I say this to people everywhere. Whether you know it or not, you can sense culture the minute you walk into a place. You can go into certain churches, and I mean, you can feel the culture and 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 especially a negative culture mm -hmm. that you're not accepted that you're not necessarily welcomed exactly. and to be a part of that family you would have to go through a tasing or literally you know different things to be accepted yeah. uh so a hazing is what i meant i said tasing that's yeah. a police term i meant uh uh hazing uh and and yet you can build in a church culture, we have discovered, you can build a culture of love. Mm -hmm. You can build a culture of, of life, mm -hmm. a culture of light. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can sense it when they come in the building. So those are some of the things that made up the book, the evolution of the book, the purpose of the book. And there's things I wrote in the book that I don't talk about a lot, but I see it in our culture, the dominant culture. And it affecting the church because yeah. of the ignorance. So yeah. from there, you know, do you want me to go ahead and try to explain woke like your original question? Yes, will you please? Yeah. Uh, woke, if you look it up in a, in a dictionary, originally it was a positive thing. The word woke, mm -hmm. it, it dealt with racial discrimination mm -hmm. and social injustice. Mm -hmm. That you were considered woke if you could discern that's racial discrimination and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that is social injustice and it is wrong. Mm -hmm. So originally the term, the term like most things was birthed in a positive thing, mm -hmm. but that entire term has been hijacked. And let me give you my definition of woke that'll help everybody. Cause I'm a simple guy. The woke movement today can be summed up in they love what God hates and they hate what God loves. That that's is really the woke movement. It. But Amen. that's really what woke is, though. I yeah. mean, things need to be simplified because otherwise they go over our head. Yeah. However, you know, everything that the Bible said is good is now evil, as you yes. will know, as you experience, as you talk about many times, whether it's homosexuality, having sex outside of marriage, pornography, you know, a lot of people support that stuff. Even Christians are starting to, you know, engage in these bad behaviors and support it as if it was something God created before time. You know, Dwayne, in your book, you talk about at war with evil forces. You know, a lot of people talk about it, but they don't really understand it. What does it mean? And how are Christians at war with evil? Yeah, uh, it, it has astounded me in the past at how many how many people in the church at large uh, ignore the presence of evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that ignoring it, innocently many times and ignorantly embrace it. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, and that is not God's plan for the church. God has a plan for us. We're here to be a blessing. We're to, here to be a restraint on evil, not a party to or embracing any fi- form or kind of evil. So the, the thing that has surprised me, and I wrote a whole chapter on it, if you look at the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, And Paul talks about putting on this armor to be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the devil. Janet, we've been delivered, Colossians 1.13, from the power of darkness, but we've not been delivered from the presence of darkness. And we're to be a light in the midst of that darkness. And here's, here's the revelation in the book that I just would encourage everyone to get, is when you look at the armor of God, it is six pieces of armor. And I remember being taught, and I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to help, uh, but you you have to put on this whole armor, and it's a big ordeal, and then go into battle, and don't go into battle without your full armor. No, the armor is the battle. That is the battle we're in with evil, is the girdle of truth. Well, what is the what is the battle then? What is the war that's going on? It's lies. It's falsehoods. It is deception. So every time you stand for the truth and you're putting that girdle on or standing in that girdle of truth, you're doing spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not spitting up demons into buckets. It's not falling on the floor, foaming at the mouth, doing a 360. (laughs) It is being steadfast, embracing, being loyal to the truth. And so you expose lies not by attacking people, lying even, but by standing firm in the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Our battle is with God's kind of righteousness and man's righteousness, self-righteousness. And by standing in the righteousness of God, it's actually a weapon. What's the weapon of the devil against us? Guilt, condemnation, shame. Well, how do you... How do you battle that evil? You know, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood and politicians and on and on. I could go with the natural. These weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. So your righteousness as a breastplate, righteousness of your heart and putting that on is how you battle the evil of guilt, condemnation and shame. And on and on I could go. You know, a lot of people don't know how to battle when you hear about putting on the full armor. In the beginning of my ministry years ago in 2006, I didn't know what it meant to put on the full armor. You know, sometimes the Bible just goes right over my head, you know. (laughs) It does us all, (laughs) but go ahead. (laughs) I get it, but we don't, you know, so much evil. You know, since we're talking about evil, I I just want to ask this question since we're on this subject. Um, Can people have an evil spirit inside them? Uh, that's been a controversial question probably for thousands of years. Uh, but absolutely people can be demon possessed at what level and who those are the debatable questions and that we wrestle with, but even Christians can definitely be under the influence of an evil spirit and, and they don't even know it. They don't understand it. Anytime you, you saddle up with evil there's a demon associated with that at some level uh so much of what we're experiencing and the rapid pace that we're seeing falling off the moral cliff is demonic it is absolutely demonic people have to have i often say this i don't mean it to be funny but people have to have help to believe what they believe today you cannot believe there's more than two genders without demonic help You can't believe some of these philosophies and some of these things that lawmakers are trying to embrace and enshrine into our law without demonic help. So there are demonic forces at work that we're truly battling with. Right. Um, Those of you that are listening, I'm talking to Pastor Dwayne Sheriff. He wrote a book, Culture Counterculture, which I love the how you put it upside down. I don't know if you came up with that. Yeah. Yeah. One of our team members flipped it uh i i I wrestle with dyslexia so sometimes things are backwards and upside down so we just we played off of it yeah couldn't i come up with that for my book (laughs) 
book, and I can't remember if it was one of the chapters, you talk about culture of hate. And we yes. know how much out there in the world we're hated because of, not because of who we are, but who lives inside of us. Define culture and what does the Bible say about hate and bitterness? Because a lot of times, you know, we just started talking about evil. A lot of times when people are evil and they treat you in an evil way, there's a lot of bitterness and hate behind that. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that you can treat people in a an ill will way and not have hate mm -hmm. working into your heart. Uh, Jesus said everything begins in the heart. You can't, you know, I, I get misunderstood in this. I'll just take a chance again. I, I think I'm clear. Yeah. But today it is absolutely impossible for me to have an affair. It, it's impossible. Now, I didn't say it's impossible for me to have an affair. I said, today, it's impossible for me to have an affair. Why? There's no lust in my heart. Right. I can't have an affair and commit adultery till lust gets in my heart. I can't murder till hate gets in my heart. I can't steal till greed gets in my heart. See, e even in the church, many times we're looking at the peripheral. We're looking at the sin itself and not considering the root. All this violence that we see, all this true hate speech is because of a heart condition that is contrary to God's plan for man. The heart wasn't created for hate, and when hate gets in there, violence is going to come into your life, murder is going to come into your life, destruction is going to come into your life. And so we not only, and this is powerful, I wish I had more time on this, I'm going to throw this at you, but because Satan has skillfully confused the church on what love is, we don't know what love is anymore. We're being bombarded. The the woke movement has hijacked the language, has redefined terms, and then imposed those terms with constant lying upon lying upon lying. And even Christians today, I have found, they don't know what love is. Well, once you're confused about what love is, now you don't know what hate is. Because if you think love is an emotion, then your conclusion will be, erroneously, that hate is an emotion. The scriptures teach that love is an action and hate is the lack of an action. And so I've been quoted many times on a phrase. I don't know if I came up with it. I don't know anybody else that said it, but I talk about silence is hate speech. Mm -hmm. That when we're silent, that's hate speech. When I speak the truth in love, it'll be called hate speech in the woke movement. Mm -hmm. But true hate speech is my silence. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus quoted when he said that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves in Matthew 22, he quoted Leviticus 19, verse 17. Uh, Thou shalt not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall rebuke him in any wise, lest you bear his sin. So love corrects. Love exposes. This is, this is evil or this is damaging to you. This will hurt you. It'll destroy you. It, if embraced in darkness, will lead to being cast, Jesus said, into outer darkness. So it's love, actually, to call things what God calls them in the motive to really help people. Not saying something is a form of hate. Like if I know the bridge is out and Miss Janet's on that road, if I love Miss Janet, I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to attack you. But I am going to say Janet, this is this is the wrong path. It's the wrong way. It leads to here, and I love you. Let me help you get off that path. I don't condemn you for being on the path, but I offer myself to help you get off of the path. That's love. You know what hate is? Hate is, I ain't saying nothing. I hate Janet. I hope she falls off the cliff. I hope she doesn't survive the crash at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> That's <laughs> hate. Listen, I, listen at Proverbs. I, I, I did a lot of child training early in the ministry in the in the church. And Proverbs 13, 24 says that to spare not the rod, he that spares the rod hates the child, but he who loves him chastens or disciplines him early. So you see in one scripture, hate is withholding discipline. Mm -hmm. Love is disciplining people with the motive of a better life, a better future, a better eternity. Uh, and yet the church has lost our comprehension of what does love look like? The Bible defines it perfectly for you in 16 attributes in 1 Corinthians 13. And then what does hate look like? 
What are the attributes that make up hate? And that's what I mean, and I define it in the book. We have a culture that embraces hate, exalts, empowers people of hate uh, in some twisted form of justice or uh, equity, and on and on it goes with the perversions that are in the mind of man today without God. And I think people embrace hate because I don't think, and I'm glad we're talking about this, because I didn't really know what love was. I came from a family that really didn't love me. It took yeah. God to put the right people in my life to see that yeah. they wanted to love me, but they weren't trying to rape me. They weren't trying to take advantage of me. Amen. They weren't trying to hurt me, but they were trying to guide me. And as you're talking about, you know, Janet, if you were going over a bridge and, you know, just say there was a hole there and you're about to go in, you're going to say, hey, Janet, don't go that way. It's not because you hate me, it's because you love me. And a lot right. of people don't understand. I mean, there's been times, um, you know, I write a newsletter, Andrew follows me. And he reads them all, you know, and one day there was something that he didn't understand. And he sent me an email and, you know, I had to, you know, do like a little rebuttal to make sure people understood what I was saying. He didn't tell me that because he hates me. He told right. me that because he loves me and he didn't want people Amen. to get the wrong idea. So I made the tweaks. But a lot of people think if you share something with them regarding something they said you know, um, to help them, they're going to like, oh, you hate me? You know, you're trying yeah. to put me down? No, I'm telling you because I love yeah. you. And we don't have an understanding of love. I didn't have an understanding of God's love until God started putting people around me that wanted to love me for Janet, not because I, I couldn't give anything. I came from welfare. I came from nothing, you know, roaches and, and <laughs> running around the house. You know, they were like my brothers and sisters at that time. <laughs> it felt like it anyway. Extended family. Extended family. So I think this is really important, but also it's important because the world thinks that supporting homosexuality is love. World thinks that by going to a gay civil union or marriage or whatever, you call, that's love. That's not love. And going Amen. to that is not love. Going to no. that is saying that, you know, I support your worldview. Right. But I'm glad we're talking about it because we know love covers the multitude of sin. But however, I think we all need to do a Bible study on what love means. Absolutely. Means and it's inexhaustible anyway. You cannot exhaust the love of God in revelation, in application. Uh, and Romans 13, 10 says, love works no ill will toward its neighbor. Thus, love is the fulfillment of the law. So a part of love is not working ill toward my neighbor. Anything out of a motive of working ill is unloving. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet everything the woke movement embraces works ill toward individuals it works ill toward the family unit mm -hmm. it works ill toward society and a civil mm -hmm. and true just and equitable society mm -hmm. uh and so it's important that these things be understood at some level right. again i'm not a I, i'm not diving into it so deep i'm consumed by it uh but i gotta know it and be aware of it to counter it to right. be the counterculture of hate i gotta understand love you to be it. the counterculture of death, I've got to celebrate life exactly. and life in abundance that comes through the cross. And I have to embrace and be loyal to light mm -hmm. to expose and expel in love the darkness. That is amazing. Those of you that are listening, if you are listening to this podcast, please share it with somebody. I'm talking with Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, who wrote a book on counterculture. He had a church called Victory Life Church. and he passed it on to his awesome son. You know, Dwayne, in chapter nine, it talks about, you talk about racism. You know, even though I know you're not a racist in any step of the way, I am black and you are white. And some people would say, you know, what do you know about racism? You're a white guy. You know, you've never been through what black people have been through. Why did you put that in book? Why did you think it was so important in your book to talk about racism? Well, I mean, the 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 motive may, may surprise you, mm -hmm. uh, because I have stood against racism my whole life. Even though my my family wasn't saved, right. they were good people. And the one character trait of my father and my mother that impresses me to this day is that there wasn't a racist bone in them, uh, and they they taught me 
to not be racist. So you have to be taught racism. Uh, and that's what's happening in the culture now. Racism is being taught. Right. Uh, and I don't want to get into that too de detailed. That could get us both in trouble. But there is a group of people that make a living race baiting. And uh, if, if, if racism is ever resolved, they're out of a job. So that's really controversial. But I actually was motivated to write the chapter because I see racism politicized and weaponized today. The race card is thrown around and abused now in a way that its motive is to silence truth or to silence any opposition to any kind of evil. If you try to step up in the culture today, and I know you're aware of it because of the ministry you have, that's why I respect you so much. I, I just think you are absolutely awesome. But as you step up in areas that you step up in, I mean, if you were white, you would be called a racist. And because you're black, though, you, I guarantee you, and I don't mean this offensively, I don't know how to say these things and not get close to offending certain groups. But today, even being black, you have to be a certain kind of black person to be even considered black. And to me, that is that is evil. That is so wrong. I have black friends that are rejected by mainstream political powers mm -hmm. who claim to be for black lives, but they're not for their black life exactly. uh, because they don't embrace a certain philosophy or way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I see it weaponized. I see it politicized. And as the church, we have to stand against all forms of racism. See, what separates the church from the world in many ways is our consistency in justice, mm -hmm. our consistency in equity, mm -hmm. our consistency in two-way streets, that there's no such thing as a one-way street. When a black person says it, all white people are racist, even if they don't know it, mm -hmm. that's a racist statement. And all you have to do is reverse it. And you would see if a white person said that about black people, everybody would scream racism. Exactly. So racism has become a matter of skin, not a matter of sin. Right. And to even say black people can't be racist is to say black people are superior to white people in sin. They can't sin There's the sin we sin. That are racist, though. I guess yeah. people, say that, say that again. A lot of are racist even against white people. They think Absolutely. Was in slavery, they're still blaming white people today for Absolutely. what was way back then, which was no fault of theirs because they weren't around at that time. But I heard more about racism, I think, not back in Martin Luther King's time, but when the Black Lives Matters came about, that's when it really, you know, escalated, you know, the George Floyd, you know, yes. Culture. Uh, all that came up, but also there was a word that I heard more at that time than I have ever heard in probably the 65 years I've been alive is Marxism. Yes. You, what is the definition of Marxism? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Again, that's a, that's a podcast, not only in and of itself, but a series of podcasts uh, to really give the full scope of Marxism. But this is what alarmed me about Black Lives Matter, Inc. I'm not talking about Black Lives. When I talk about Black Lives Matter, Inc., the movement, the founders. And I found myself in a forum. I have to be careful here uh, because love does cover the multitude of sins. I don't want to uncover something that's forgiven and, and needs to be just overlooked. But I was in a, a forum where I was asked to speak about what the Bible says and everybody else was going to speak on Black Lives Matter and history and all these other things. And uh, I was actually booed going to the Bible, trying to explain why this is not God, why this is not godly. And in that particular meeting, I had the opportunity to meet one of the local Black Lives Matters in a huge place. I won't name it, but uh, she was very uh, mean. Uh, very angry. And I, I, I just had to calm her down and just say, look, are you at least aware that the founders of Black Lives Matter, Inc., are professed Marxist? Wow. They 
are trained in the revolution and how to come about forming a revolution and publicly. I'm not saying something that someone said about somebody. That's what's hard about even conversations like this. Uh, I, I'm uncomfortable with so-and-so said so-and-so. But when the founder is interviewed and says, I am a Marxist, then no Christian should sign off on that. Yeah. And yet I'm seeing entire churches embrace Black Lives Matter, Inc., and embrace violence, hate, uh, the devil. Jesus said, here's the fingerprints of the devil. He come to steal, kill, and destroy. And I mean, every, every, every pathway and aftermath of Black Lives Matter, Inc., Mm -hmm. falls under those three categories and yet christians couldn't couldn't see because satan always comes as an angel of light i really believe black lives do matter i do believe we should defend black lives when there's social in true social injustice or true racism someone being judged based on the color of their skin but black lives matter was promoting violence and and uh looting uh, and on and on I could go. So when I said to her, do you understand the founders of this organization are professed Marxist? She looked me right in the eye with anger and said, I don't care if they're full blown Marxist. Right. I'm going to march and I'm going to do what it takes to turn this stuff. You know, so she had she's a Christian. Mm -hmm. She was a professed Christian and she's embracing violence she's embracing hate and she's embracing marxism now marxism obviously comes from karl marx mm -hmm. and one of his most famous writings was on the communist manifesto right. and within the communist manifesto and i i want to emphasize communist uh, we have a whole generation that doesn't see the evil of socialism and the evil of communism because they've not been exposed to it. So they embrace socialism, not even understanding socialism is the path to communism. Socialism comes by ballots, voting for other people's stuff, mm -hmm. and communism by bullets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're on the path in socialism of bullets, of war, revolution. Mm -hmm. So he breaks down in the Communist Manifesto five tenets. And man, how a Christian can't see through all five immediately and go, whoa, First of all, communist is an atheistic government. Mm -hmm. What Christian would want to be lorded over by an atheistic government mm -hmm. uh, where the government becomes deity? I mean, have we read the Bible? I, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> I mean, it was ungodly governments that persecuted God's people at every level throughout human history. It's ungodly governments, atheist governments that have killed millions of people, mm -hmm. untold millions. So the first thing within the, the communist uh, manifesto and tenets is social evolution. Mm -hmm. Karl Marx believed in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution within animals that societies evolve the same way. Survival of the fittest, which is racist and bigotry and uh, atheist in and of itself, and, and that we are to evolve to evolve in in uh, three areas uh, our societies economics mm -hmm. and then government and he wrote and taught that government was utopia that a state government a supreme government communism was utopia mm -hmm. when it's dystopia not utopia there's no place in history biblical or natural where governments that are atheist are for the people no, they starve their people. They kill their people. They're, they're, they're tyrants, and on and on it goes, but that's what Karl Marx taught. The second one was the redistribution of wealth from each according to his ability unto each according to his need. That sounds like half our politicians, that you have to, you have to take from the haves mm -hmm. to give to the have-nots, and you call that justice. You call that equity. Mm -hmm. When the Bible calls it thievery. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so anyway again it takes time to explain that the third one was uh, an attack on capitalism that it was the oppression of the masses and this is where people don't realize that when people attack capitalism they're 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 wanting to evolve into socialism to communism because capitalism with all its faults 
is still a natural system and opportunity of gaining wealth, of getting out of poverty instead of being locked into it. And he said that it was what oppressed the the masses. So you got to do away with capitalism to evolve into socialism, to then evolve into communism. The fourth one is religion. He called it the opium of the masses, allowing evil and capitalism to exist. Mm. So anyone who embraces Marxism is against Christ. They would have to embrace the Antichrist mm -hmm. to be for, for Marxism because Marxism believes religion, your conscience and worshiping the true and the living God is what allows evil in the world and capitalism. And then the last one, Janet, and I'll, I'll quit. I tried to do it as quick as I could, is what he called the revolution. Right. And you can see it in the marches. You can see the destruction of private property. You can see the pulling down of monuments, which some of those things needed to be dealt with. There were issues with those, but violence and tearing that down, I'm okay with dealing with whatever might be wrong with a monument, but if you're going to tear it down, what gets tore down next? And, and other monuments that the people were so ignorant were tearing down were godly people mm -hmm. that even stood against racism uh, and on and on I could go. But the bottom line is it, it, it embraces atheistic societies that thus the woke movement, everything is atheistic. It's anti-God, anti-Bible, mm -hmm. anti-Christ and economies where what they call equity is spooky to me. Everybody having the same house, yeah. same salary, same piece of dirt in front of you, and you don't even own that. The state owns it. Uh, so the whole world or, or the whole nation becomes a part of even government housing. How's that worked out even for the black community when you're honest about it? It's yeah. terrible. The Bible teaches the ownership of private property. Why? You, you value it then. You take care of it. You, you can prosper from it uh, by selling it. You can leave it to your children, your grandchildren. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So everything, therefore, the Bible is against, uh, yet you have Christians embracing Marxism. Wow. You know, you can get um, Dwayne's new book, Counterculture, and you can learn more about what he's talking about because he breaks it down very well, as you can tell. He knows what he's talking about. You know, Pastor Dwayne, we're coming to a close here. I have about five more minutes. The world is getting so further and further and further away from God. Every day that I go out there and minister or even go to the store, you can just see that, you know, there's more sin. You want to see God in everything, but sometimes that sin just overpowers. And we're getting further and further away from it. Why do you think that is? is it well, it's sin? just the is nature of Marxism. Is it because of all the bitterness and the hate? Or I, I think those contribute, but those are those are side effects. Uh, those are the symptoms. Uh, the root is evil. The root is darkness. See, darkness, darkness isn't happy with today's boundaries. Mm -hmm. Darkness has to increase. That's why when you see one sin is accepted, boom, you, you have the unraveling. Like once homosexuality was accepted and embraced, then now you're seeing uh, pedophilia. You're, you're, you're seeing uh, all kinds of, of abuse of women at, at unprecedented levels. Even, even the lack of ability to, to define what a woman is. Uh, all of these things in evil, by the way, lead to an abuse of women. Uh, and so you can you can take you can take this all the way back to the garden and and it's the devil. It is evil. And in Genesis chapter three, uh, the devil approaches Eve. And what does he say? Hath God said? And she says, well, absolutely. He said, if I eat of that tree, I'll surely die. You will not die. Right. That's the woke template. Hath God said there's only two genders? Well, yeah, God said. No, he didn't. Hath God said marriage is between a man and a woman? Yes. No, no, he didn't. So it is an attack on God ultimately and on his character. And and that's why we can't take this stuff personally. I guarantee if anybody doesn't like me, it's because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, because there's nothing. 
That's yes. I mean, well, there's nothing worthy, and I don't mean to throw you into my camp, but there's nothing worthy I mean, to even like or dislike about you and me, independent of God. Exactly. No, it's God in us that makes us loving. It's God in us that makes us kind. Right. It's God in us that gives us clarity. Yes, there's two genders, male and female. Get over that so you can have a functional life. If you can't get that straight, then everything's <laughs> going to unravel. Yeah. Uh, again, back to back to the nature of God is love. Mm -hmm. So when the world says, oh, you can't deprive these people of love. Mm -hmm. Well, if 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 a man can love a man and that's OK, because they call it love. Why can't a stepson love a stepmother if they call it love? But first Corinthians chapter five condemns it. Uh, why can't a teacher love a 15 year old? Mm -hmm. uh, because there's boundaries to the love of God. Right. So we're seeing everything unravel because we've gone to the core finally in our generation. You and I are the same age mm -hmm. and we finally come to everything that is moral, decent and near to the heart of God is being questioned. Right. Then it's being rejected. And the church is just simply not being the church. We will see darkness increase more if the church continues to retreat. There's a point where there's a great awakening coming, Miss Janet, and I believe the church is waking up that, wait a minute, this is crazy. This is insane. This is demonic, and I'm not going to subject my children to drag queens in the library mm -hmm. defiling their moral innocence. That's not being hateful. That's not being mean. That's love That's to protect love. your children. Yeah. So the bottom line, I'll say the most controversial thing about God's kingdom in the earth right here in closing, uh, darkness will get darker. And Jesus said, because you love darkness, you're going to be cast into outer darkness because it has no end. But the light is going to get brighter even in the darkness. So you are going to see a division. You're going to see more godly division between sheep and, and goats, between light and dark, between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the gap is going to get increase, and there's going to be a point where everyone in darkness would have made their choice, and Jesus is coming back. And it's all going to be wiped away, all evil from the earth. And we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Hallelujah. Well, this has been amazing. Those of you that are watching Counter Culture, please go get this book. Pastor Duane, where can people get this book? We know wherever books are sold, but can they come to yeah. your website or Amazon? or? Yeah, they're definitely in bookstores, but you can come to my website, Pastor Duane, D-U-A-N-E, PastorDuane.com. Or you could call us and order the book. Area code 580-4040-DSM, Dwayne Sheriff Ministries, DSM, or that's 404376. And we can pray for people. Obviously, we have prayer lines, and they can order the book from us even now. So please go to his website and get the book. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen. Pastor Dwayne, you are a blessing. I love you so much. Thank you for being on Healing in May for your Janet Boyings. Well, I love you too, and Sue sends her love. God bless you, Janet. Thank you for listening to Healing and Made Free with Janet Boynes. Acts 1034 says, God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't play favorites, which means what he has done for Janet, what he has done for guests on the show, he will do for you too. If you are struggling with anything, do not hesitate to reach out to Janet Boynes Ministries. They will do their best to help you any way they can. Go to the website, JanetBoingsMinistries.com. Janet loves you, and most importantly, God loves you. Have a blessed day.